Uh, hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, continuing our course in the poetry of T.S. Eliot. Uh, in this session, we're going to take up Portrait of a Lady, the early poem by T.S. Eliot. Very fine, dramatic poem, would have to say. Now, the two poems we've discussed, discussed so far, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and Sweeney Among the Nightingales portray the conflict between realism and romance. We'll define romance for our purpose, perhaps in the simplest form, as a hunger for a better life than what reality offers. In the case of Prufrock, to achieve romance, he would need to broach his feelings to the lady at the party, uh, but that would require strength beyond his capacity. Reality simply won't allow it, nor even the fantasy of mermaids, a substitute for romance missing from his wife, life. In Sweeney Among the Nightingales, we might say that romance would require a return to the past of antiquity, a past when actual heroic or epic literature, a heroic view of life, in fact, was not only possible, uh, but had actually been achieved by the writers such as Aeschylus or Shakespeare or other such writers that T.S. Eliot refers to. Uh, and in the case of Sweeney, of course, naturalism means that we can never aspire to that superior view of life, what we might call a romantic view of life, of the distant past. Now here in Portrait of a Lady, we still have the conflict between romance and realism, uh, loosely defined as I have. Uh, in this case, the romance pertains to the woman who wants to achieve a better life than what she actually has through having a more intimate relationship with the young man in the poem. The young man in his turn represents, I think we would say, uh, T.S. Eliot's mode of realism in that he will repel the advances of this woman, will not permit a more intimate relationship, in fact will break off the relationship by the end of the poem. Portrait of a Lady a title that may well derive from Henry James's novel, The Portrait of a Lady, his first great novel back in 1881. Certainly we're back in the style of Prufrock, in the social milieu of Prufrock or of Henry James, if we want to apply the title in that fashion. Uh, and so there's a very rigid protocol on the part of both the young man and the woman in the poem. She, for her part, though she wants an intimate relationship, uh, must not be too forward, as the word would be in her time, or more aggressive than a polite society would allow. He, for his part, must pretend as a gentleman to take an interest in the lady must not rebuff her uh, advances too blatantly. Uh, so, as in Henry James, you will have in this poem by Eliot, a whole lot going on under the surface of a purportedly polite conversation, a genteel relationship. Now, to move to the epigraph under the title, uh, from Christopher Marlowe, his play, The Jew of Malta. Marlowe was one of the most cynical playwrights who ever lived, hard-boiled, uh, utterly cynical. In this play, The Jew of Malta, the Jew, who would obviously be a villain because he's a Jew, back in Marlowe's time, a contemporary of Shakespeare. Uh, in this poem, the Jew, near the end of that work, 
is being accused of murder and being an extremely resourceful fellow like other Shakespearean villains such as Iago, he tries to stave off the accusation by confessing his guilt to a lesser crime. So the play runs then, thou hast committed um, um, fornication, but that was in another country, and besides, the wench is dead. Uh, a very hard-boiled, cold-blooded attitude indeed of this villainous character towards the female uh, in another country, meaning, of course, that the laws of this country don't apply. And it is a title that was used by Hemingway, the same title in another country for one of his short stories, used by James Baldwin in a novel, Another Country, and in many other places in subsequent literature after T.S. Eliot dug it up as usual in his ransacking of the past for useful fragments in our time. In the poem proper, uh, indeed something similar would happen. That is to say, at the end, the wench is dead psychologically, and the young man is in the position of this Jew of Malta in that he killed her psychologically. At least there is that motif of guilt on his part for having done harm to this woman. Even the another country motif plays a part in that the young man does go abroad at the end. Now, the poem is related through the eyes of this young man visiting the lady for a dinner party. And whereas she sees it as a romantic occasion, which she hopes to broach her feelings, he sees it in an entirely more cynical mood. Among the smoke and fog of a December afternoon, you'll have the scene arrange itself as it will seem to do with a romantic comment by her. I have saved this afternoon for you. We proceed what is with what is a dinner party, an intimate party for two, a candlelight dinner that she has prepared. But for him, these candles of the dinner represent instead a funeral, a wake. He even brings forward a failed romance that ends in the grave, Romeo and Juliet. Four wax candles in a darkened room, he says. Four rings of light, an atmosphere of Juliet's tomb. Uh, well, we have been, let us say, the young man goes on, to hear the latest poll. Transmit the preludes, Chopin, through his hair and fingertips. Uh, this, of course, is a highbrow society. They have had a romantic evening listening to Chopin from the woman's point of view. Um, and she tries to make her appeal for intimacy in those terms. So intimate, this Chopin, that I think his soul should be re resurrected only among friends. Now, Though she is restricted by genteel protocol to be not too aggressive, she is allowed to make this much of an appeal. Let's be friends. In fact, that would be the motif that gives structure to this poem more than any other. The same purpose that was served by the word back in Prufrock, question, lift and drop a question on the plate. Do not ask what is it, let us go and make our visit and so forth. Here the word friends, which he is permitted to use to make her appeal, uh, is something she repeatedly uses in this effort to gain a more intimate relationship to the young man. 
So Chopin then, his soul should be resurrected only among friends. Uh, some two or three will not touch the bloom that is rubbed in question in the concert room. Now the young man thinks to himself that he wants to stave off her approaches. And so for his part, uh, he thinks of the carefully caught regrets, the velleities through annuated tones of violins. And uh, she go he goes on listening to her appeal. You don't know how much they mean to me, my friends, and how rare and strange it is to find in a life composed of so much odds and ends, to find a friend. Uh, well, um, she goes on then to describing the friend, presumably the young man's qualities. A friend who has these qualities, who gives those qualities upon which friendship lives. How much it means, I say this to you, without these friendships, life what cauchemar, French for a nightmare. For the young man, as we end part one, a portrait of a lady, instead of enjoying his memory of the Chopin concert, he's developing a head headache. Uh, she presumably has put on some romantic music on the Victrola, that rather primitive music-making machine. And um, he listens to the windings of the violets, or excuse me, the violins, the ariettes of cracked cornets, and inside my brain a dull tom-tom begins, hammering a prelude of its own. As we end section one, then. The woman has made her appeal on the basis of being friends. He, for his part, tries to stave it off as we end section one by putting on his social mask. Let us take the air, he says, in a tobacco trance. Admire the monuments, discuss the late events, correct our watches by the public clocks. Sit for half an hour and drink our box. Uh, so let's maintain the social protocol that's necessary for the occasion, but he will not allow anything more intimate than that. As we begin section two, A Portrait of a Lady, uh, a bit of time has passed, several months from December now to April, a month that he would call the cruelest month at the beginning of the wasteland, for the same reason as it is cruel here. That is to say, in the springtime, the hormones, if nothing else, will cause a surge of romantic feeling, a desire that the lady feels even more keenly. And the young man observes her now in this visit, holding some lilacs in her hand, and of course, that's the romantic flower also at the beginning of the wasteland. Now that lilacs are in bloom, she has a bowl of lilacs in her room, a romantic flower. She twists one of them in her fingers while she talks, and she goes on plying that one maneuver that is permitted to her, let's be friends. Ah, my friend, she says, you do not know what life is you who hold it in your hand. You let it flow from you, and youth is cruel. He perhaps is a little younger than she is, and has no remorse, and smiles at situations which it cannot see. Now, the smile is his social mask, and he does see the situation very clearly indeed, but hiding behind his mask, his smile, he does not have to uh, make that visible. He goes on then, I smile, of course, and go on drinking tea, the social ritual also that he will hide behind. And the woman goes on talking in her romantic vein, intensifying her appeal for a deeper friendship. Yet with these April sunsets that somehow recall my buried life, a uh, reference to a poem by Matthew Arnold, about a hopelessly isolated 
introverted um, sensibility. Uh, in Paris in the spring, I find the world to be wonderful and youthful after all, she says. And for him, you might say the headache continues from part one. The voice returns like an out of tune, broken violin on an August afternoon. As she continues, uh, she's unlike Prufrock, she actually does broach her feelings. She makes an effort within the circumference the society allows her to, uh, to operate within. I'm sure you always understand, she says, understand my feelings, sure that across the gulf you reach your hand, which he certainly is not doing. You are invulnerable, you have no Achilles here, she says, Achilles heel, I should say. And uh, at this point, many a one has failed, she goes on to admit. But what have I, what have I, my friend, to give you? What can you receive from me? Only the friendship and the sympathy of one about to reach her journey's end. I shall sit here serving tea to friends. That'll be her future living only on the level of ritual, of social protocol, if he continues to reject her appeal. Now, he does just that, as part two continues. I take my hat. How can I make cowardly amends, he says, for what she has said to me? And the social mask, of course, continues with a sort of narcotic. As he reads the newspaper, uh, he can emerge or submerge, I should say, his consciousness in that a mode of escape from the actual situation that he should be confronting, what to do about the woman's appeal. Instead, you can see me any morning in the park, reading the comics and the sporting page. Particularly, I remark, uh, this young man is of Eliot's own social milieu, and he looks down with disdain at the recent immigrants and their low-class ways. Particularly, I remark, he says, an English countess goes upon the stage uh, that presumably betrays her high-class protocol to do a vulgar thing like that. And as he reads the paper, a Greek was murdered at a Polish dance. What else could you expect from the low-class rabble? Another bank defaulter has confessed. And through it all, he does exactly the opposite of what friendship requires. By his own confession, he says, I keep my countenance, the social smile. I remain self-possessed. When you're a friend, a real friend, you invest yourself in the other person. You make yourself vulnerable. The young man does no such thing. I remain self-possessed, except the subordinate clause does add something, indicates a sense of guilt on his part, as we conclude part two of Portrait of a Lady. I remain self-possessed, except when a street piano, not Chopin, but this low-class music, this popular music, uh, the great bulk of which is about some sort of torch song, some lament about unrequited love. And so when that kind of music strikes his ear, when a street piano, mechanical and tired, reiterates some worn-out common song, with the smell of hyacinths, another romantic flower that'll show up in the wasteland, recalling things that other people have desired, is the note of guilt. Are these ideas right or wrong? His conscience at least slightly touched. The wench is dead. Or at least certainly I haven't helped her emerge from her dead-like state, similar to that of Prufrock. Now as we come to part three, the concluding section of Portrait of a Lady, we've moved now across almost a full year in the relationship between the young man and the lady. The October night comes down, returning as before, except for a slight sensation of being ill at ease. 
Now, in fact, by the time we're through with this section, he will have de delivered a death blow to this woman psychologically. Uh, so being slightly ill at ease is an understatement. The way he really feels, the pile of guilt that is working on him is indicated in the image that he gives us in the next lines. I mount the stairs and turn the handle of the door and feel as if I had mounted on my hands and knees. I feel like a dog going up to this woman's apartment with a message that I have to bring her. Now, Elliot doesn't tell us. He doesn't show us uh, the man delivering the message. What he shows us is the woman's response. And it is a wonderfully woman-wise response in the sense that in affairs of this sort, the woman is likely to be miles ahead of the man. Any move he can make, she sees through it instantly. So we have the woman responding to this, to her dreadful news. So you are going abroad. And when do you return? Now, from this point on, there will be a battle under the surface for the control of the relationship. The man believes he has ended it with his announcement he's going abroad. He won't be seeing her anymore. But um, the woman wants him to know that she still has a string attached to him. So she makes this uh, question, when do you return? And then she realizes that is too aggressive. She's being too forward. She's not entitled to ask that question. So she backtracks. When do you return? But that's a useless question. You'll hardly know when you are coming back. You'll find so much to learn. She pretends, according to protocol, that she's happy for him. Uh, on his part, he almost loses his mask. My smile falls heavily among the bric a -bac. Now she plants a string on him that she knows she is entitled to plant there. Perhaps you can write to me. And he knows he has lost ground with that statement. My self-possession gutters, excuse me, my self-possession flares up for a second. This is as I had reckoned. As she goes on now for the final time with her appeal based on that recurring word. I have been wondering frequently of late, but our beginnings never know our ends, why we have not developed into friends. And the young man now feels a much deeper, sharper pang of guilt. I feel like one who smiles, and turning shall remark, remark suddenly his expression in a glass. My self-possession gutters. We are really in the dark. She continues, for everyone said so, all our friends, they were sure our feelings would relate so closely. Well, you will write at any rate. Perhaps it is not too late. And she does have him there. As a gentleman, he must write to the lady when she puts this appeal to him. Meanwhile, she is left with nothing but her social protocol as he abandons her. I shall sit here serving tea to friends, she says to end her comments. And the young man now very nearly loses his self-possession, his social mask. I must borrow every changing shape to find expression, dance like a dancing bear, cry like a parrot, chatter like an ape but he does finally get the mask back in place. Let us take the air in a tobacco trance. Now, as we conclude the last stanza, a portrait of a lady, uh, he tries to rationalize that death blow he delivered. Well, what if she should die some afternoon? It's not my fault. Should die and leave me sitting pen in hand. Now that's a big triumph on her part. 
She did keep that string planted on him. He does have to write to her. But suppose she did die back there, literally, uh, as I go on writing to her as she required. Um, not knowing what to feel or if I understand and so forth, would she not have the advantage after all? Perhaps she does, forcing him to keep that string attached. Uh, this music is successful with a dying fall, he says. Now that we talk of dying, that pang of guilt right to the end, should I have the right to smile? He ends with that question. A rhetorical question, presumably, he does not have that right, as we conclude. Now, several things stand out about this poem. Uh, in the first place, it's a highly dramatic poem. It involves two characters, so you could almost put it on the stage. And so much is conveyed through dialogue, through what they say to each other. And of course, if you added some, let us say, some monologues, uh, what Shakespeare calls soliloquies, then you could get the contrast between what they say and what they really mean on the part of both parties. So we can almost anticipate from this poem that eventually T.S. Eliot would become an actual playwright. Another thing that stands out here is the, is the possibility, and I think plausibility, that this poem is based on a real-life relationship. Eliot wrote over a thousand letters to a woman named Emily Hale, H-A-L-E. Uh, she, later in her life, wanted to publish these letters from T.S. Eliot, he um, put his lawyers to work and prohibited the publication because by some peculiar quirk, the woman did own the letters, but T.S. Eliot owned the publication rights. And so they finally agreed that in the year 1919, after everyone who might have any connection to their relationship would be long gone into the next world, at that point, the letters could be published, and they are on deposit, in fact, I think at Princeton University, where uh, many of my reading audience, or I should say listening audience in this case, uh, will, I think, be around to see what is in those letters. You would have to think with over a thousand letters, there must have been quite an important relationship going on. We do know that Emily Hale did expect Elliot to marry her, and she was absolutely crushed when word came from England that he had married some young woman they had only known for a space of about two months. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, was uh, no longer available to Emily Hale. After his wife died in 1947, and Elliot was now free to marry again, she'd thought once again that he would correct the error of his youth and marry her. And she and Elliot's sister even sprang a surprise when he visited his sister, and then she sort of popped in out of nowhere, expecting that Elliot would resume their relationship, and instead he was ferociously angry with his sister. Uh, we'll carry on uh, in our next session with a couple of more poems before we get to the wasteland. I plan to, plan to look at a poem called Preludes and to a poem called Gironchen. <clears throat>